Could you name all those mamas? A lot of them. I could hear the ripple through the crowd when you saw somebody that you knew. Well, it is a great day to be in worship. We have a lot of things to celebrate. By the, besides the fact our God is good, it's great to honor our graduates and pray for them. And also today, we want to recognize that for many who are here, um, as a mama, you are weary. And for some of you, um, it's been a long night. For some of you, you may be grieving today. This is my first Mother's Day without my mom. For some of you, you may have not, never been a mom. And for some, you may have been mama to children who were not your own. And for some, you have mothered little ones that are not your own, but they didn't know anything but a mom except for you. So we don't want to add to your grief today, but we do want you to know that you are loved and you are seen by the Most High God. And God has a purpose for you in this season, and we are thankful for you today. So would you join me in prayer? Lord God, we are thankful for your presence, for your care for us, for your generosity of love and grace and mercy. And in this time today, would you mold our hearts so that we could look and love more like you. And Lord, today, would, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So friends, we're walking through the book of Acts. Every week we're just going to the next chapter, and so this is week five, and I want to tell you I have been thinking about week five for a long time now. Um, I spent a lot of prayer, I've had a lot of conversation with people, and so I just want to share with you something from chapter five of the book of Acts. Okay, starting out verse one. It says, But a man named Ananias, with the consent of his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property with his wife's knowledge. He kept back some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now Ananias, Peter asked, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, were, you not, were not the proceeds at your disposal? How is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You did not lie to us, but to God. Now when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and died. And a great fear seized all who heard of it. And the young man came and wrapped up his body and then carried him out and buried him. Now after an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter said to her, tell me whether you and your husband sold the land for such and such a price. She said, yes, that was the price. And then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Look at the feet of those who have buried your husband, and they are at the door, and they will carry you out. And immediately she fell down at his feet and died. And the, when the men came in, they found her dead. They carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> what do you do with that, right? So I was just like, we're going to have to take a little bit different turn today in chapter 5. We're going to just do a, something a little different. So in this book, we continue, if we read on in this chapter, we read that Peter and John continue in their mission. They're telling people about Jesus, even though they've been told in the previous chapters that we've been reading, stop talking about Jesus. They've healed people, they've been persecuted, they've been beaten. And so I thought, well, while we were reading this, maybe we would just look at a little bit different part of this that we haven't looked at before. So in Scripture, we hear a lot about what the men did, but we don't often recognize how much the women were doing and being part of the early establishment of the church. And the world perpetuates this story that God favors the leadership of men over women. Now, I grew up in that culture, and when I was called to pastoral ministry, the very first thing I said was, God, I'm a girl. And so I had to pray and have God show me through Scripture how that was going to be okay for me to be in pastoral ministry. For I, I didn't even know until seminary about women like Perpetua and Felicity. Perpetua was a noble woman. She was well-educated. She was of great wealth. She had a child, and she was a martyr for telling people about Jesus. Felicity was a young, uh, pregnant woman. And she was also martyred for telling people about Jesus. Um, Perpetua was only 22 years old and kept great diaries telling about her journey that took her to martyrdom. 
I didn't hear about women like this until I was in my 40s. And when I heard about them, I thought, wow. That in the early centuries, in the third centuries, there were women that were such a threat to the establishment, they were martyred. I had no idea. But to think that God favors men's leadership over women in the church goes against everything I see in Scripture. And I want us to look at that today because Jesus, we see that Jesus healed women. We see that Jesus relied on women, that women financially supported Jesus, and that Jesus favored women in many times because of what the gifts that they were bringing as well. Now, women in the first century could not testify in court. Their testimony would not have can be considered value or authentic. But it was, yet, it was women who Jesus had tell the world about the resurrection of him. It was women who did this. Now, all through Acts, we read of Peter and Paul, and in Acts 9, we'll read more about Paul. But through this, we see that they do foundational work for the start of the church in the book of Acts. But even in their writings, we see some unfavorable opinions about women. P, um, Paul dedicated decades of his life to write, um, establishing church and writing letters to these churches to encourage them in their work. And one of Paul's letters we study still today, which is the book of Romans, it's some deep waters, but it tells foundational truth about who Jesus is as the Messiah. And interestingly, when Paul wrote the book, um, the letter to the church in Rome, he had Phoebe, a deaconess, send this, take, take this letter to the church in Rome because she was a leader that he could trust and one who was an active leadership in the church. And when Paul encountered Jesus, he was transformed in a mighty way because Paul had been part of the religious leaders who would often stand on the street corners and pray and say, I'm glad, thank you God, I'm not a Gentile. Thank you God that I'm not poor. Thank you God that I'm not a woman. Yet it was Paul who wrote these words to the ch church in Galatia. We read in chapter 3, verses 28. In Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There is nor male or female. You are all one in Jesus Christ. Now, this would have been a revolutionary message to that time. But simply put, we have to remember that although we are reading letters that Paul wrote, they were written to a specific church, a specific group of people at a specific time. Paul had no idea about Sedalia, Missouri when he was writing these things. He was not concerned about the church in America. He was concerned about the group of people that he was addressing at that time. So it's very important that we remember the culture and the context that these letters were written in. So I'm going to give you an example of what this looks like. Many of you have probably heard the pot roast story. A young woman and a young man get married. She's going to make this great pot roast for lunch one day. So her husband is watching her prepare the pot roast. She brings this pot roast in, puts it on the cutting board, cuts off the end of the pot roast, and throws it away. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's a pretty good piece of meat there. What are you doing? She says, that's how you fix a pot roast. What do you mean that's the way you fix a pot roast? You just threw part of it in the trash. She said, that's the way my mom makes it. He goes, well, we're going to call your mom and find out what she says. So she gets on the phone, calls her mom. Mom, I'm making a pot roast, and my husband's asking about how I make it, and I want you to tell me, how do you make your pot roast? She said, well, it's easy. You take the pot roast, you cut off the end, you throw it away, and you make your pot roast. And he's like, that's crazy. Who taught you how to do that? She said, well, my mom taught me how to do that. So the young girl calls her grandma. She gets her grandma on the phone. Grandma, I'm making a pot roast, and how do you, um, I, I was talking, telling my mom and asking how my husband how I make a pot roast. You take the pot roast, you cut off the end, and you throw it away. She said, no, 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 no. You don't throw the end of the pot roast away. She said, well, Grandma, why did you cut the end of your pot roast off? She said, because I never had a pan big enough for it. And that's often how things are passed down. We take that context and we apply it to our own, not even knowing why we're doing it. So we're going to look at this a little more closely today. And what we need to know is that the Bible gives, um, gives attention to women more often than any other religion 
or school of ph philosophy. And so we see that we are created, men and women, in the image of God. And that's a pr unique perspective that we see in Scripture in the way that women played in the lives of Jesus and in the establishment of the early church. So we're going to look at the women in Acts. Now remember, the, the book of Acts is about the actions of the apostles. So if I've invited some women of First Church to help us share the stories from the women in Acts. The first one we're going to hear about today is Tabitha. Hi, my name is Madison Westermeyer, and today I'm going to be reading the Acts of Dorcas from Acts chapter 9, verses 36 through 40. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, Please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them out, all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. Now, Tabitha's story is a remarkable one. She's, we see her, if we read more, she's selfless in all she does. She provides clothing for the widows. She provides clothing for the poor. And then she dies. And it's devastating to that community before what she was doing to help people. And she told about the good news of Jesus Christ through her actions. So as soon as she dies, the widows come and share what she's done and ask Peter to raise her from the dead. And with the power of the Holy Spirit, this is what happened. But Tabitha is mentioned by name because of the powerful things that she was doing to share God's love in that community. So now we're going to see what Mary, the mother of John Mark, does. Hi, my name is Angie, and I'm going to be reading today from Acts 12, 12 through 16. Still shaking his head, amazed, he went to Mary's house, the Mary who was John Mark's mother. The house was packed with praying friends. When he knocked on the door to the courtyard, a young woman named Rhoda came to see who it was. But when she recognized his voice, Peter's voice, she was so excited and eager to tell everyone Peter was there that she forgot to open the door and left him standing in the street. But they wouldn't believe her, dismissing her and dismissing her report. You're crazy, they said. She stuck by her story, insisting. They still wouldn't believe her and said it must be his angel. At this time, poor Peter was standing out in the street, knocking away. Finally, they opened the door and saw him, and they went wild. Peter put his hands up and calmed them down. He described how the master had gotten him out of jail, then said, Tell James and his brother what's happened. He left them and went off to another place. Now this is Mary, John Mark's mother, not the Mary, of G uh, Mary the mother of Jesus. Um, it's mentioned that she owns the home, which there's a lot of things in the literature of that time that taught us without actually teaching us. And one of the things that they would do is by saying like, the home of Mary would have been telling her that the home was owned by her and not someone else. So it's likely that she is a widow. And she is hosting all of these people in her home to be praying for Peter because he's been persecuted, he's been jailed, he's been flogged. And so Peter, having escaped from jail, comes to the door. Well, poor Rhoda, she's the servant there. She opens the door, sees it's Peter, so shocked, shuts the door and tells everybody he's there. But nobody believes her. 
And so he stands there knocking on the door till finally they go and open the door for him. But Mary's position as a woman hosting the Christians in her home and Rhoda's name being mentioned in Scripture, the fact that she was a servant was remarkable for that day. It's evident that they were faithful leaders in the early church. The next one we'll hear about today is Lydia. Hi, I'm Becky Ott, and I'm going to share the Acts of Lydia from Acts 16, 12 through 15. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony in the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Tyratira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer of the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house, and she persuaded us. Now, Lydia was wealthy. She dealt with purple cloth, which was the color of fabric for the wealthy, for the royalty. And by Lydia helping Christians at that time, put her household and her business at risk. But another thing we see that happens is when Lydia comes to know of Jesus Christ, her entire household became to know the Lord. So it wasn't just herself. And in that time, they would baptize their entire family and those serving in their home. And Lydia took a step of faith, opened up her home for Christians to gather there, and led her entire household to Jesus. Demarius is the next one we'll hear about today. Hi, my name is Kathy Yuki, and I'm going to be reading from Acts chapter 17, verses 32 to 34, about Demarius. Now when they had heard the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, We will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed. Among them were also Dionysus, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with him. And we don't hear much about Damaris. She was likely just heard, overheard one of Paul's sermons. Um, it was took where he preached in Athens. But what we do know is that because she was mentioned, she must have done a, a, a remarkable play, job within the uh, early church. Now, she was an Areopagite, meaning that she was a member of the Areopagus. Now, that would have been like our courts. And she would have been maybe an attorney or a, 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 a judge. And we would have known she would have had training in speaking and debate um, sitting alongside men and women. And Greek, uh, Greece offered a different climate for women of that time, but it was important that she was mentioned because obviously she had played an important part in the movement of Christianity within Athens. And now we'll hear about Priscilla. Hi, my name is Madeline Colvin. I'm going to share the Acts of Priscilla, chapter 18, verses 1 through 3. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Now Priscilla and Aquila are faithful companions of Paul, and we'll hear more about them as we continue reading. But the interesting thing, again, again in literature, the name of the person having higher rank, more prestige, more education, was always listed first. And everywhere in scripture that we read about Priscilla and Aquila, we read her name first. They were faithful companions for um, in many different t- places in scripture that we hear about them. And together they took a step of faith and served Jesus um, through serving Paul as we read in the book of Acts. And the last one we're going to hear about today are the daughters of Philip. Hello. My name is Murray Page, and I'm going to read Acts 21, verses 8 and 9. The next day we left and came to Caesarea, and we went into the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who had the gift of prophecy. Now we don't know what his four daughters said, but we do know that prophecy is a gift of the Holy Spirit. 
and it's used to benefit for the local church and to benefit them in the situations that they were dealing with. And these um, girls, and we daughters, we don't know their ages necessarily, but these daughters were used in a powerful way in the Holy Spirit to help form the early church. And the book of Acts is, um, affirms these gifts in their daughters by having the um, fact that they were mentioned in Scripture at all. I'd invite you all to give me a big thank you, help me thank these ladies for helping us today. Now, friends, this message today is not necessary, um, necessarily given just to elevate women. Um, although I do think it's important that we understand Scripture and the role of both men and women in this holy text. The message of this um, today is to remind each of us of the importance that each of us play in God's plan in this world. Now, Luke wrote the book of Acts as well as the Gospel of Luke, and he's demonstrated a particular interest and highlighting the gifts and the roles of women in the early church. We see him talking about humble positions of servants, the esteemed, the empowered, the educated women, as well as people who were influential in society. But they were not passive people. They were active in the story that we read in Acts with the um, spreading of the gospel and the beginnings of the church, which is why we are here today because of the church that was started after Jesus was crucified, resurrected, and ascended to heaven. But this message today does beg this question. What was it, who was it in your life that told you about Jesus? Was it your father? Was it your mother? Was it a high school teacher or maybe a friend you went to school with? Was it someone that you ran into throughout the week, a store clerk, or maybe an employee, or a coworker, or your boss? Was it somebody who taught vacation Bible school or Sunday school? And then whose name will be written next in someone else's faith journey? Your son? Your daughter? Will it maybe be this little girl that we baptized last week? This little boy that we baptized a few weeks ago? Or maybe one of his sisters? Will it be one of these children that will one day be a pastor, an evangelist that tells the good news of Jesus Christ? You know, it's not about the size of the thing that we do, but it's our act of faith. It's coming in and acting even when we feel fearful. It's those moments that we don't think we can do it. But what we do read in the end of Acts chapter 5 is this from one of the religious leaders. It says, therefore, in the present case, I advise you, speaking of Peter and John, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. Friends, when it's of God, it cannot be stopped. And so we read these moments and we're like oftentimes scared to step, take a step in faith. We're, we, we're afraid that if we go forward in our faith, we're too fearful to do that. But what we learn is as we take a step of faith in, and when we're fearful, faith is given to us in that moment. And we read Jesus' words in Matthew 17, 20. It says, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Now, a member of our congregation this week sent me this cover photo of a book by uh, Joyce Meyer. It says, Do It Afraid. And in each of the accounts that we heard of today, each of these women had reason to be fearful. Their lives were literally in harm's way because of the stand that they took for Jesus. Jesus. Yet, they did it. They put faith on over fear and went forward with what God was calling them to do. And we can do the same today. But we will never know the gift of faith because faith comes from God. We will never know that gift of faith until we say we will take a step even when we're afraid. Even when we're fearful. And we read from all of these powerful testimonies today of what God continued to do through these people because of their faith. 
So friends, today I want to encourage you as we pray this prayer that we have been praying each week of this series, that today you would pray for God's faith to be given to you so that you can go forward with what you're called to do in this season. Would you join me? Dear God, when we doubt, give us belief. When we are indifferent, give us compassion. Give us grace over hostility and hope over despair. And most of all, give us faith over fear. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.